Well, open your Bibles this morning, if you will, to the book of John, chapter number 12. The book of John, chapter number 12. I want to be sensitive to the leadership of the Lord this morning. I tried to talk myself out of this sermon because it's a holiday weekend. <clears throat> the devil said, well, there won't be anybody at church on Sunday that needs an evangelistic message. All the sinners and the backsliders will be gone to the lakes and the different places. There'll only be a few of the faithful come on a holiday weekend. But I want to preach this morning like everybody in the house is going to hell. And this may be your last Sunday to get saved. And my heart's heavy this morning from this message that the Lord's impressed upon my heart. And I trust you'll pray for us and give us your attention in these next few moments as we try to bring the message. I want to bow for a moment of prayer and then we're going to read just a couple of verses out of John chapter 12 and bring the message. Father in heaven, as we come this morning... Lord, we come before the throne of grace with thanksgiving in our heart for the privilege we have to assemble together in this place to worship you in spirit and in truth. I want to thank thee, Lord, for our country that has afforded us the privilege to gather and to worship thee according to the dictates and the leadership of our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And I pray this morning you'll meet with us in a special way. In these next few minutes, I pray that you'll quicken our heart to your word. And help us, Lord, to be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit as we preach. And I pray that every heart in this place will be open and receptive to the Word of God. And Lord, may this solemn truth today find a lodging place in the heart of somebody that's here today that needs Jesus as their Savior. May we that are saved be stirred to a new awareness and a new awakeness. Lord, to who we are in Christ, and the fact that you're soon coming and what we're doing, we must do hurriedly because Jesus is soon coming. Bless and honor your word now to your own glory and we'll give you the praise for it because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 12, verse number 35. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have light lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and hid himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. I want to call your attention this morning back to verse 36. For our text verse, Jesus said, While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. While you have light, he said, believe in the light. I want to preach this morning on this subject from verse 36. When light is gone, Jesus said, while you have light, believe in the light. Now the indication from that statement is you won't always have light. You won't always have light because he said, while you have light, believe in the light. We know the scriptures teaches us that Jesus came into this world to be the light of the world. Men have light. It's hard to comprehend how people can be born in America and live in America with so much preaching and not have light. The fact is, though America has light and though people have light, they will not always have light. There are some things this morning that I want to mention, just three or four things that will put out that light. And when light is gone, what a sad tragedy that it is. What about the light of conscience? 
Did you know every person is born with a conscience? Every person has a conscience. He has been given the light of his conscience. But men have convinced and educated their conscience to the degree that they feel that whatever they want to do is all right. And most people, and I say most people, it appears that way from what we're seeing and hearing in our land that most people have so convinced their conscience that nothing is wrong anymore, nothing bothers them anymore. Now I say to you that it's a sad time in an individual's life when the light of their conscience goes out and they no longer have a conscience. That they can do wrong, they can live in sin and iniquity and even violence and they have no conscience that bothers them. Beyond me, how a person can do some of the things that we hear and see about doing and lay down and go to sleep at night. The light of their conscience has gone out. And I want to say to you this morning that an individual is in serious trouble when the light of his conscience goes out. And his conscience no longer bothers him. The scriptures talk about not only a conscience that is, that is convinced and educated but it also talks about a conscience that is calloused. Sad, sad, sad. But you know one of the things that characterize the day in which we're living in is a conscience that is so callous that nothing touches it anymore. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1, the Bible said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, notice this, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Their conscience is seared, or their conscience is calloused, so to speak, until nothing bothers them. Paul wrote again in Ephesians uh, chapter 4 and verse 19. And he said, Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Think about that. Who being past feeling, they have given themselves over to lasciviousness. Now you say, what does that word lasciviousness mean? Well, it simply means unrestrained sin. Unrestrained immorality. In other words, a person who just takes the brakes off his life and nothing bothers him no matter what he does, that he is past feeling and he just gives himself over to the control of sin and Satan. Now, how can you read the newspaper? How can you watch the news on television without knowing that we're living in just such a day when people are past feeling and they have given themselves over to unrestrained sin and immorality to just do whatever Satan and sin bids them do? But I want to say to you that an individual is in serious trouble when, he, when the light of his conscience goes out and nothing bothers them until they are unmoved anymore and they're past feeling. And we see that people lie, cheat, steal, and murder. And all the violent crimes that we read about and hear about in our day and people being past feeling. You see murderers, mass murderers even, on television at times interviewed that show no remorse whatsoever for the crime they have committed. What is that, preacher? That is a person, the light of their conscience has gone out. Jesus said you better believe in the light while you have the light. When the light of your conscience goes out, you're in trouble. There's a second thing this morning in relation to light, and that is the light of reasoning. Remember what the scripture said in Isaiah verse one and verse, or chapter 1 and verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, 
Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as snow rather. And Jesus, or the, or the Lord said to come now, let us reason together. While there's reasoning in you, come to me. Do you know people this morning get beyond reasoning? And there is no reasoning with them. The light of reasoning goes out in their life and they're beyond reason and there's no way you can reach an individual when he gets to the place the light of reasoning has gone out. You can't reason with him. I've seen people so engrossed in sin that they had no reasoning about them. They were so, their life was so engulfed in sin and the devil had such a hold on their life until they had no reasoning whatsoever about the life they were living. They were beyond reasoning with. Have you ever seen people that you could just sit back and look at their lives and, and you say to yourself, my soul, can't they see what the devil is doing to them? Can't they see how the devil and sin is destroying their life and yet you talk to them and it's like pouring, as the old saying goes, like pouring water on a duck's back. There's no amount of reasoning in them. What is that, preacher? The light of reasoning has gone out. You can't reason with them. I've seen people so engrossed in sin until there's no reasoning with them. I've seen people get caught up in, in materialism and riches until there's no reasoning with them. You remember that man in Luke chapter 12 I mentioned the other Sunday? <clears throat> Whom the scripture said that he had been successful, his business had grown and multiplied, and he said to himself, I think I'll just tear down all these barns and build greater barns. Before the night was over with, after he had that talk with himself, the Lord came calling and he said, Thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. The light of reasoning had been put out by his love for riches. Do you know that one of the characteristics of the last days that men will be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God? The things of this world have a hold on people. There used to be an old song, I haven't heard it in years, that used to say, I don't want to get adjusted to this old world. You remember that old song, I don't want to get adjusted? Well, you know what most of our problem is? We're too adjusted to this world. And many people are so adjusted to the things of this world that the light of reasoning has gone out in their life and they have no reasoning about them. Do you know that I visited people in the hospital that the light of reasoning had, had been put out by their pain and suffering? I remember visiting a lady one day in the hospital. She had been given a death sentence by cancer. And she was in the closing days of her life, the doctors had done all they could do. And I remember visiting her one day in the hospital and I, tried, I, I made an attempt to talk to her about her soul and she let me know in no uncertain terms, Preacher, this is not the time for this. I, I'm, I am so sick and, and I'm in so much pain that I, this is not a good time for you to be talking to me about this right now if you please. And so I excused myself and left the lady alone as she asked me to do. And as far as anybody knows, a few weeks after that, that lady went out into eternity. And as far as anybody knows, she never trusted the Lord as her Savior. And she never accepted Jesus. And, and she went out into eternity. The light of reasoning had been put out by pain and suffering. May I say to you, if she had been in, in her own reasoning mind, she would have said, if there's ever going to be a time for me to get saved, now's the time. I know that I'm on my way out of this world, and now's the time. Why would a person knowing that they had just a few days to live say, this is not the time for this? I'll tell you why. The light of reasoning had been put out by pain and suffering. You know, a lot of people say, well, preacher, don't you believe in death, re deathbed repentance? Yes, I believe in any kind of repentance. I sure do, but I want to tell you something. You have no promise that when you're on your deathbed that you'll have enough reasoning in you to repent and accept Jesus. The light of reasoning. Don't get beyond reasoning. Don't allow the light of your reasoning to go out. 
Because that is the way you get saved. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. A lot of reasoning can be put out. There's a third aspect of man in, in this light, and that is the light of Holy Ghost conviction. You know, you don't hear much preaching about Holy Ghost conviction anymore. But I want to tell you, when you get saved, it'll be because the Holy Spirit of God convicted your heart that you were a sinner and reproved your heart that you were a sinner and revealed to you your need of a Savior. No man can come to me except the Father that sent me to draw him, Jesus said. Scripture said about the days of Noah in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with the heart of man. You say, that was in the days of Noah, preacher. That's all the way back over there in the Old Testament. In the days of Noah, when the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with the heart of man. What's that got to do with the day? Well, Jesus said it had everything to do with the day because he said, If you want to know how it's going to be just before I come again, he said, Read the days of Noah as it was. In the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And he said, My spirit shall not always strive with the heart of man. The light of Holy Ghost conviction. You know what I believe? I believe there are people in hell this morning who would give anything they could possibly give but they have nothing to give. But if they had everything to give, they would give it all to sit in one more service and to hear one more imitation. Him saying, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. They'd give anything just to hear one more plea from some preacher somewhere saying, come to Jesus while you have time and opportunity. They send away their days of grace and the, and the light of Holy Ghost conviction went out and they went out into eternity without the Lord. You don't hear much preaching along these lines anymore because everybody wants to portray God as just a, a loving God that loves everybody, and one of these days, everybody, no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, God's just going to gather everybody up in one big happy family one of these days and take us all to heaven because after all, we're all God's children. The Holy Spirit must convict a man's heart. If they ever get saved, there is a such a thing as a sin and the death. There is such a thing as a man sinning away and crossing God's deadline. You remember a man by the name of Felix? Let me turn over there for just a moment. I'm not going to be too long this morning, but in Acts, Acts chapter 24, turn over there with me for just a moment. In Acts chapter 24, remember a man by the name of Felix that Paul appeared before when he was in prison. The Bible said in verse 24 of Acts 24, after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. I want you to notice something about this scripture. Look in verse 26. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul that he might loose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. And bear in mind, verse 25 said, the first time that Felix sent for Paul, Paul came in. Felix wanted to hear about the faith in Christ. And Paul came into Felix's room and he expounded unto him the things of the Lord. And he reasoned with him of temperance, judgment, and, or righteousness and judgment to come. And the Bible said that Felix trembled. Now why would a man in Felix's position tremble in the presence of a prisoner like Paul who was a little old scrawny, frail, framed of a man uh, who, who was a preacher in prison for the gospel that he preached. Why would he tremble in his presence? He certainly wasn't afraid of his physical being. 
Why did he tremble when Paul preached to him? I'll tell you why he trembled. Because the Holy Spirit of God convicted his heart about placing his faith in the same Lord and the same Christ that Paul talked to him about. And the Bible said that he trembled. Holy Ghost conviction, if you please. The next verse said, Felix, he hoped that Paul would offer him some money and he would set him free. If he, in other words, if he'd give him a reason to let him go, Felix would have turned him loose. But Paul wasn't going to bribe him. He wasn't going to give him any money. And so the Bible said that Felix sent for him the more often. And he communed with him. In other words, they talked often and they talked many times. But down in verse 27, but after two years, Fortress Festus came into Felix's room and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. His heart was kind of calloused. He kind of, he as the saying goes, took a liking to Paul that first time he met him when he was under conviction. And he was seeking and looking for a reason to let him go because he wanted to let Paul go. But after two years of reasoning with Paul and listening to Paul, because he wanted to do the Jews a pleasure, he left him in prison. He had become cold-hearted and calloused. What was that, preacher? i tell you what I believe it was in light of the context of these scriptures that I've read to you. He sinned the way his days, of, his days of grace. He crossed God's deadline and the Holy Spirit withdrew from him. For two more years, but we never hear about him trembling anymore. We never hear about anything. He said, go away, Paul, and when I have a convenient season... I'll call for you. And I'll say to you the best convenient time in all this world, the only convenient time to get saved is when the Lord's dealing with you. You put it off and you say, it's not convenient this morning, preacher. Maybe some other time. How do you know? How do you know that you won't end up like Felix? Oh, I'll be back to church again, preacher, and I'll listen to you preach again. Maybe so. But how do you know the Lord will deal with you the next time you come? I believe a just God gives every man opportunity to hear the gospel. But we're not promised, and there's nothing in this scripture to teach us that God will just keep on pleading and keep on pleading over and over and over again. Now, many of us are saved and many of us got saved not the first time the Lord dealt with us, but the Lord had dealt with many of us several times. What I'm saying is, the, I'm not saying he won't, I'm just saying he's not obligated to. Amen. There's many people this morning, the scriptures teach us that God does give. That's not good modern day preaching, but it's good Bible preaching. Amen. The Lord does give up on people. Romans chapter 1 Romans chapter 1, the scriptures talk about the Lord giving up on people. You say, well, I don't believe the Lord will ever do that, preacher. Well, it's a question of whether you want to believe the Bible or not. And that's really the issue in our day, folks. It's, it's, I mean, it's either where you want to believe the Bible or not. See, the Bible, the man has changed down through the centuries of time. There, with each generation, man keeps on changing, but the word's the same. The word don't change. They're trying to write a Bible for our times, but they're having a hard time doing it. This is the book that the Lord's given us. He talks about in these verses. Let me just read you several of these verses. We got time to do that. You don't have to go to work tomorrow. Look in verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that, which, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Do you know that God has created enough and given us enough creation and witness of creation that man has no excuse not to believe in God if he didn't have anything but creation talking to him. And that's what he's saying in verse 20. But look in verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man 
and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore? Wherefore God also gave them up. I want you to notice these words. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. That is not what this generation's doing. I don't know anything. Change the truth of God into a lie and say that that's not what this means. Oh, that's your interpretation. And worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26 For this cause God gave them up and the vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves. Now if you'll notice this, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. We're seeing that today. Receiving it in themselves, that recompense or that reward for the era that was meet or suitable for them. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Three times in these verses, the scriptures talked about God gave them up. God gave them over. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things. Nobody wants to talk about Romans chapter 1. Now listen, you say what you want to about me. You lock me up and haul me off somewhere and put me in a cage. But this book don't change. This book don't change. And this ungodly mess we're seeing in our day Today, and, it, and, and that we're being force-fed on every hand, does not change the truth of this book right here that says that God, if a man goes down that road in that lifestyle and keeps on going and keeps on going, that God will give him over to a reprobate mind. And he'll let him do those things. We're seeing that in our day. I know I'm probably getting criticized for this. But I'm going to say it anyway. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for every individual that has ever drew a breath, regardless of who they are, where they come from, what their lifestyle is, what the color of their skin is. Every individual that God ever put breath in, Jesus died for them. I believe that he can save any, anybody. But you want me to tell you what I believe? You say, preacher, do you believe the Lord could save a homosexual? Yes, I do. If I didn't believe that, I'd close this book up and quit preaching. I wouldn't be a hypocrite. I'd never preach another message if I didn't believe that Jesus and the power of God could transform the life of a homosexual. I'm going to tell you what I believe this scripture right here is. When a person pushes God out of their knowledge and they, don't, and they change the truth of God into a lie, and they become proud of who they are, and they put a sign on their back, and they broadcast it, and they become bold and brazen in their lifestyle. I believe they've reached the point that, that Paul is talking about right here in Romans chapter 1. I believe God's already turned them over. There is no hope. Now hear me well. So if you're going to shoot at me, make sure you've got the right ammunition and make sure you're shooting me for the right thing. If... If they, I, I believe any individual in order to be saved must be ashamed of his sin. Now that goes for the homosexuals or the adulterers or the fornicators or the drunkards or the thieves or the murderers. No man can ever have any audience with God apart from acknowledging and being ashamed of his sin. And when a man is bold and brazen... And he has no shame for his sin. There is no hope. 
to that individual. Now, you can say that's a homophobic preaching, but that's that old militant, mean-spirited, fundamentalist preaching if you want to. That's just Bible preaching. Yeah. That God gives them over to a reprobate mind. I'm going to tell you something else. I believe there's a lot in our day that has crossed God's deadline and God has withdrawn His Holy Spirit from them that don't just, that don't just fall in the class of homosexuals. I believe there's a lot of adulterers, wife stealers and husband stealers, and a lot of baby killers. I believe there's a lot of people that have crossed the deadline and God has turned them over to do those things that they seem to be bent on doing and God's given up on them. I believe we're seeing a generation like that. He said it's going to be that way again like it was in the days of Noah. And he said, my spirit's not always going to strive with the heart of man. When the light of Holy Ghost conviction goes out, and I believe as long as a man's got some shame for his sin, there's hope for him. But when he reaches the point he's not ashamed of his sin, no matter who he is, I don't believe there's any hope for him. If he, if he can, I don't, I don't want to get, I'm going to, I want to get on past this, but, it, but, it, but it's here, it's here, and it's in my heart. And I want to love sinners, but I want to hate sin. And there's no, listen, there's no big sin and little sin. Now, you and I, you and I go back. I said a moment ago, I'm just an old redneck, red-blooded American. I'm a man from the sole of my feet to the top of my head. I'm just a man all over. And I've always been proud to be a man. Never have wanted to be nothing else but a man. Never have wanted to look like nothing but a man. Amen. Amen. I never have wanted there to be no doubt about it. Anybody's mind. I'm a man. I believe, I believe that we're seeing in our day all of this upheaval. I sat over there last night and I read several articles. I read, I read an article, and I guess this is what got me started up. I read an article by a former preacher, supposed to be a preacher, that said that, that he had preached for a number of years. And he draw this conclusion. He said, I come to this conclusion that there's no way that I could be a good preacher or a good Christian apart from total honesty. That I could not be a good Christian and a good preacher and a good representative of the Lord Jesus Christ without total honesty. And he said, for years I've been living a lie. And he said, so I've come out and decided to be honest. I'm gay. And he said, I know I'm not accepted anymore by preachers in the eyes of men, but I'm still a preacher in the eyes of God. God loves me just as much today as he ever did. And that's so. He got that part right. But God hated his sin enough that he sent Jesus to the cross Amen. to die for it. Honesty. And we're, we're hearing all these things. And you know, nobody wants to hear anything about judgment anymore. But the light of Holy Ghost conviction that reproves a man's heart makes you feel the shame of your sin and the remorse of your sin. And by the way, you can't repent without being sorry for your sin. And Jesus said, except you repent, ye shall likewise perish. Well, there is no relationship to God apart from repentance. And there is no repentance apart from sorrow for your sin. One last light that goes out. That's the light of life. Hebrews 9 and verse 27, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. What is your life, James said? It's only a vapor that appears for a little season and then vanishes away. Now, a lot of folks have, you and I believe, that after death, you'll still have a chance. I taught in Sunday school this morning, and I, said, I made this statement. I said, five seconds after death, you'll wake up in heaven or in hell, one of the two places. And when the light of life goes out, hope is gone. Hope is gone. Did you realize what opportunity you have this morning to be sitting in this building and have light? To have light? The light of life. The light of the Holy Spirit's conviction. The light of reasoning. 
the light of conscience. If you have those things, you ought to thank God for them. And if you're not saved, I plead with you to give your life to Jesus while you have light. While you have light, believe in the light. Believe in the light while you have light. While every head's bowed and every eye closed. I know it's getting late. I know the sermon maybe has not been a pleasant sermon. But I've tried to preach you the truth this morning. Somebody's eternal destiny may be decided in these next five minutes. Do you realize this morning that what you do in the next five minutes in this service could determine where you spend eternity? It could determine where the light goes out. Believe in the light while you have light. I plead with you this morning, if you're here in this building, you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. Give your heart and life to him today. Do it today. Don't let another moment go by. Do it today. If you're here away from God, you're cold and indifferent in your heart. Recognize that Jesus is soon coming. Recognize that Jesus said, we must work while it is day for the night cometh when no man can work. And if you're ever going to do anything for God in your Christian life, you need to do it now.